I remember driving around, you know, looking at Christmas lights one year, and my father said to me, he said, isn't it amazing, these, these big, beautiful houses that are owned by the most successful people in our area? And he said, don't be envious. He said, look at those houses and ask yourself, how many problems did those people solve for other people that put them in a position where they could have an amazing house like that? Where you've got difficulty, you've got an opportunity for people to come up with solutions. In the first two years of my franchise, I, the, the main thing I learned is how unequipped I was to run a business. I think for you to have been as successful in your business as you have been, you obviously on a deep level, want to help people succeed. 100%. And uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background. Yeah. Um, so some of the family va family values that I was raised with are hard work. So it's it's honorable to work hard. Yeah. And it's honorable to uh, start at the bottom and learn everything on the way up. Yeah. And the opposite of that is something that we believe too. It, you know, if you get a business somewhere where the owner refuses to get his hands dirty, that's dishonorable. Um, like, uh, I suppose a building company that's run by a um, an accountant or a lawyer, mm. we would say, well, that, that's that got obviously structural flaws in it. Mm. That person doesn't has never had their hands dirty on the building site. Yeah. So that's why I went through carpentry and worked on building sites Mm. Um, because that, that was the path. You start at the bottom and you work up. But the other thing that I was, value that I was raised with is that um, you have to help other people. So to, to become successful in life, most successful people end up helping at least seven other people become successful. That's what studying success stories will show you. Mm. There's always a, a group of people that get successful together. It's never one guy that just <coughs> jumps out. Yeah, it's a principle, right? It's a principle. And <coughs> I remember driving around, um, you know, looking at, at Christmas lights one year, and my father said to me, he said, isn't it amazing the, these big, beautiful houses that are owned by the most successful people in our area? And he said, don't be envious. He said, look at those houses and ask yourself, what did those, how many problems did those people solve for other people that put mm. them in a position where they could have an amazing house like that? Mm. So that was the attitudes and the values that I was raised with. And so when I got into uh, Australia, married, you know, I married my Australian wife, found myself here mm -hmm. where I was past that. Mm. stage of life where you're single and you don't really care about money too much mm. suddenly I was married it all mm. it all was important all of those things came back and I was like okay I'm going to learn what I can about construction I'm going to try to get better at it uh, a little bit every day and uh, all of those values came back what can I do that'll help other people and in a way that I'll just have to trust the system that will end up coming back to me Mm. So franchising is really good for that because it's a long journey of setting up things and putting money into it to set it up and, and build the systems and buy the software and create the, the, the uh, documentation and the training and the branding and the plans. Mm. It's, a, it's a big investment. For the first probably three years, uh, you, don't, you don't get anything back. I, I actually lost money. I had a building company that funded this mm. franchise development. Mm. And I would suspe expect mm. you found the same thing, setting up your businesses. There's a stage where the, you have to go through uh, mm. an expensive, long, drawn-out setup period where the cash flow goes the wrong way. Mm. Yeah, it's funny, point. right? So some people see, you know, when you, they, they, they don't see the pain, the years of torture, right? For you to get to the point where you are making some money, you, you can divest and invest in other things and help other people, right? Because you can't help anyone if you're broke, right? Look, you can to That's a right, point, yeah. but I mean at large scale, you can't, right? So yeah. I'll, 
I remember saying to the GM, like, how do we give away a million dollars worth of programs to people who need it? And the only way we can do that is to generate money, right? To build them, to market them, to get them out into the hands of the right people, right? So I think some people miss that, right? Uh, and that it's that tough journey, right? If, if I was to go back, so when you were talking about your father, you know, about the Christmas lights and, and he lay instilled that, that principle or that value on you. Were you here in Australia or were you? That was in Canada. That was in Canada, yeah. So when, when, did, you, when did you migrate to Australia? What year was that? Uh, so I, I came over in <clears throat> around 96, 97. I, I finished um, two years of study in construction engineering technology at the mm -hmm. Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. And I came out of that. Um, now, I was not a top student. I find the academic scenario pretty tough, mm. um, which is something you hear about with a lot of um, entrepreneurs. Yeah, they, they don't do well in that environment. So I really struggle. I come out, and I actually went through a period of time where I, I was quite unsuccessful. I, I just yeah. couldn't find the way forward in life. And I actually found myself one day out there, Lawrence, on a building site in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Yeah. It was minus 35 degrees Celsius. Shit. And I was shoveling snow off of the floor that we had nailed down the day before. Mm -hmm. And my nail gun kept freezing up because what happens in those cold temperatures is that the air compressor condenses moisture out of the air. Yeah. And it causes your nail gun to freeze up about yeah. every half hour. Yeah. And then you trudge through the snow back to your, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your, your trailer, open yeah. it up, yeah. you unplug the air hose and you pour methylated spirits into the line. Yeah. Plug it back in, go back to your nail gun, blow the alcohol through the line, yeah. and then you can use your nail gun for another half hour. Yeah, right. And I, I really felt that I'd done this training. In the old days, we used to use hammers, right? <laughs> well, you that. can do that too, yeah. but it was, it's, yeah, I know what you're saying. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hit this point where I, I was going through other things the same stuff that a lot of people go through in their early 20s where, yeah. you know, you get your romance life and that's not working yeah, out very yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, and, yeah, and so yeah. I kind of went, I went to my uncle who owned a travel agent and I said, look, I got this paycheck here this week. I don't really have any bills to pay. How yeah. far, where could I go with this paycheck that's warm? Wow, is that right? I got really cold last week and <laughs> I kind of... Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was un Uncle Don. So he said, the first thing he said to me is, where do you where do you think? I said I've heard about Australia. I've heard it's warm there. It's about all yeah. I know. Yeah. He says, "Well, have you told your mother about this?" That was yeah, first thing that's he a said, good yeah. question. <laughs> so, anyways, I said, "Well, I'll get around to that." But yeah, he yeah. said, "Well, where do you want to go?" And I yeah. said, "Look, I, I don't actually know the names of any of the cities over there." Yeah. He said, "Well, I guess Sydney's the the big one. So, how about yeah. we buy you a ticket to Sydney?" Yeah. And that was in 1997, and. I knew a few Australian people in Canada. Um, I had a couple uh, phone numbers written on a scrap of paper. Yeah. Um, it was just a, a fellow that I'm still friends with. He was uh, an aircraft engineer. And uh, the other phone number the guy gave me, strangely enough, was for the lady that ended up becoming my wife. Wow, really? Yeah, it was pretty weird. That's super interesting. Yeah. And, and how, how old were you when, you when you came here? What year was that? So that was around... 96 it, i might have come over like in december of 96 i think yeah right like that. and so 1990 so i met uh i rang these two phone numbers and they're like university kids they're like oh yeah. we're having a party why don't you come you can throw your sleeping bag down on our floor for a while and yeah so i hung around with them for a week i actually met my wife and she was going out with some other guy and uh, yeah right. she was just really nice to me and yeah i stayed in touch with her and yeah. I bought a motorcycle. Uh, what sort of motorcycle was it? It was an XT600. Yeah, and right. It was so the a worst dirt bike. Was that a dirt bike? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was the worst motorcycle to ride around yeah. Australia because it was black plastic. It's a Yamaha, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And every time I stopped and got back on it, the the um, hot black plastics would burn yeah. the skin. And so yeah. I I set it up for touring. I, I stopped at a, a fellow's workshop and i welded a piece of rio to the rack on the back and yep. bolted my backpack on it and yeah great i could do wheelies in third <coughs> gear was so heavily loaded 
Yeah. But, you know, I traveled along and I, I stopped in different places. I remember vaccinating pigs in one place, just working <laughs> for a farmer. And wow. Just whatever work I could find. And yeah. I went uh, surfing there with uh, some other people at Port Lincoln. And I just stopped along the place. Mm. I got a lift up to um, Alice Springs mm. with a road train. Mm. Um, so that was really cool. And anyways, I just do things like that. And then I um, got on this bike and I headed across to Nullarbor. And what happened is, I don't know, you, I, I, I'd reckon a farm boy like yourself would know all about bikes, but the XD600 had a unique back rear wheel structure where the spoke came up and did a 90-degree turn where it hooked into the hub. Yeah, okay, yeah. And that, because I had the bike loaded up with luggage and it wasn't yeah. really meant for that, Yeah. the spokes were, were breaking off at that bend. Yeah. And then the centrifugal force would drive them through the tube. Yeah, right. So I was halfway across the Nullarbor. I was at the Belladonia Station, and I was about 100 kilometers off into the desert after that. And the spokes broke and shot through the tube. Yeah, and, right. you know, I remember pushing my bike into the um, bush and hitchhiking back and then getting a tow truck, coming, getting the bike, ordering spokes. Yeah, yeah right. Anyways, I went all the way around <coughs> Australia, drove drove headers. I actually seeded wheat crops in, in WA, and then I drove headers in North Queensland. So you're on your own, right? All of this is just your, you're just on the bike traveling from place to place, yeah? Yeah, and okay. I, yeah. I, I actually... Early 20s. I think you'd be super early yeah, 20s, right? Yeah, yeah. T- around 24, I think, yeah. 25, something around yeah. there. Yeah. It was a great trip, but by the end of it, I sort of got this sense that I was meeting a lot of people that were my age, had yeah. a lovely little wife, a couple yeah. of kids already on the way. Yeah. And I thought, I, I really need to get myself sorted here, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay, got it, yeah. And I, I didn't really plan it out, but I um, come back, and I basically started going out with my wife four days before I had to go back to Canada. Yeah. And we were like, you know, th- we've got a, this is a connection here. Mm. Um, so I went back. I was back on the tools again, and... Mm. She jumped on a plane and come over, and then we got married. And so I ended Sorry, up. Sorry, hang on, let's backtrack. So you went back to Canada. She got on a plane and went and and flew me and, over. and flew to Canada. Yeah. yeah. So you guys are living there together. Yeah. Right? Well, we well we didn't live together. A bit more old fashioned than that. Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she um, she come over and she worked it. She was actually an architectural draftsman. She had just finished oh, right. studying architectural yeah, yeah, yeah. drafting yeah. at Cogra TAFE. Yeah. Okay. And so we, uh, she come over and got a job with an architect there in Calgary. Yeah. And uh, then we got married. And we, after we got married, shortly after we went, okay, let's let's settle down somewhere. She actually found the Canadian winters really hard to handle. Yeah. Just the whole idea of not being able to open the windows and all that. Like, mm. I couldn't work out what was so hard about it. Mm. But she uh, she found it. No birds. No flowers can't open the windows Mm. so anyways we came back and uh we settled down in um penrith pen penshurst uh, Mm. near hurstville in sydney Mm. and i it was just after the big hailstorm in 1999 i don't know if you remember that but sydney had a massive hailstorm that just wiped out like hundreds of roofs Mm. and so i got on a crew doing that i eventually did my carpentry apprenticeship with that crew, got my um, Australian qualifications sorted out. Yeah. And then I, I did my uh, building license at Moree. Yeah. And uh, and I've, I've done up a little house in Sid- in Inverell, and I sold that. And then we came back to Sydney. And yeah. uh, there was just a perceived more opportunity in Sydney. And I had some really great experiences. So I basically took some business card and, and I put them on the counter of the Hudson's hardware there in uh, Peakhurst. Mm. And a, a guy called me, and he was a ma- he turned out to be a massive mentor. So he was an architect, and he, w- he had bought uh, a Boy Scout hall in um, Hurstville, and mm-hmm. he wanted to convert it into an architectural home, a really um, interesting architectural-style home. And he needed a lot of really one day at a time carpentry work done Mm. so 
I went and worked for him for a few days, and he come to me one day, Lawrence, and he said, look, he said, I'm really happy with your work. You just need to get more of it done. And he said it to me that way. And I said, oh, look, you know, I'm sorry. The weather's been a bit warm. I, I, I probably should have been moving a bit quicker. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get He didn't mean that, though, did he? No, he didn't mean no, that. No, he didn't What mean he that. meant was that he wanted me to hire some people. <sighs> yep. And so he explained this to me. And he said, I'm happy for you to charge a margin on the time. He said, you're good at organizing. And he said, you're good at communicating. And he said, I think you need a few more carpenters to make the best of. Yeah, to get it done. So suddenly, um, like I'm not, I don't like lifting heavy things, you know. Yeah. Suddenly I had carpenters there that were strong. They knew more about Australian carpentry and building than I did. I was still yeah. doing my building license. Yeah. And it was the first time I really, it took me about three or four months to understand, well, why, why did this architect pick me and tell me to go hire carpenters? And, wh and why did he? Did you figure that out? Yeah, I did. And it was reinforced by these carpenters asking me the same question. They'll go, mm. you just turned out from Canada here. Why are you my boss? You're on. And I, I said, I don't know the answer to that. But the answer eventually worked out that it was because I was better with people than I was with wood. Mm. And I was able to organize all the invoices and getting everyone paid and making mm. sure that everybody's tools were mm. available and giving people a goal at the start of the day and reflecting on it at the end of the day mm. and all that stuff. And interestingly, one of the carpenters that worked for me in that day, fast forward to when I, was, I started the franchise of Stroud Homes, I started selling, he came to one of my presentations, mm -hmm. and he, he was he was great what he said to me. He said, James, he said, of all the carpenters that we, we kind of knew back in that day, he said, you were the guy that was going to go somewhere. He says, it's a good thing you did, too, because you're a bloody terrible carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just he was being honest, right? Oh, I don't know. Maybe he was inaccurate, but... Um. No, no, he was, and, you know, the <clears> thing <throat> was is I was always organizing everyone, and when I did have a chance to do some carpentry work, their skills were better than mine. Mm. Uh, I wasn't proud of that. So I, I just had to uh, kind of get used to the idea that that's who I was and that, that these skills were, were pretty important. I wasn't proud mm. of the fact that I wasn't that great at, mm. at carpentry work. Mm. Um, I could do it, but I had to really slow down and think about it. And mm. for me, it was much better to have a, a good crew. So from that point where the architect suggested I hire a fella, I ended up hiring settling in with five carpenters and I always had yeah. an advertisement in the paper looking for carpenters mm -hmm. and I got a reputation with a number of builders uh, that ended up being over in the eastern suburbs who who I was a guy that you could call to get a lot of really complicated carpentry done really quickly mm. um, so we worked in Longueville we worked in Bellevue Hill Double Bay Camaray mm. um, were these guys full-time working for you or contractors? They were um, contractors. And, you know, like we, I <coughs> couldn't do what I did back then now because the mm. laws have sort of changed. Mm. But what we did a lot of was um, these homes were built up the, the hill overlooking the water in those yeah. different areas. Yeah. And they had a lot of concrete steps that needed to be covered with hardwood treads and risers. Mm. So we'd set it out on the wall and pack it up and put each step in one at a time and, mm. and then put feature panels on the timber panels up with shadow, yep. shadow lines and things yep. like that. So then I, um, I got into uh, a bit of shop fitting. I did the La Senza store at Bondi Junction. Yep. Build, again, I wasn't the prime contractor. It was a builder who, yep. who needed carpenters and... Th this is another secret that I, I learned to the industry is that builders are always looking for someone to organize things. You know, if you're good at organizing things, yeah. you can make it happen. Um, builders will eventually leave you alone on the job to yeah. just get things done. Yeah. Just leave yeah. you to it. Yeah. Yeah, that um, 
it's a skill set that you know builders and chippies don't have, right? Carpenters don't have that high level of organisation. Like there's ten things you need to be across every day, you know, res safety, materials, other subcontractors, and all that sort of stuff, right? So there's a lot to juggle. You always see them on their phones trying to manage it during the course of the day, but it's a bit difficult, right? Yeah, and some of the old guys <clears throat> will suggest that mobile phones have caused us to to be less efficient at planning the work mm. you know getting bricks delivered getting materials on site mm. um, choosing whether to uh, um, put the the timber flooring down and then the skirting boards or the skirting boards and then the timber flooring mm. you know all of that sort of planning work mm. it's you know it's possible that we're because of mobile phones, people just tend to ask the question rather than becoming good at planning and, and mm. thinking things through. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. So where did that come from though for you? Like, Is it like, did you learn that at uni? Was that instilled with, by your father? Is it organic? Like, is it natural for you to do that? I think it could be all of the three. Like yeah. I did have that yeah. two years of technical yeah. training. Yeah. And I, I should have learned something out of that, right, Lawrence? Yeah, yeah. Um, my dad was a pretty organized guy, so I yeah. would have learned some stuff off of him. And, yeah. what, and what did he do? Farmer, right? Uh, no. So dad, um, dad built some houses. So when I was yeah. young, him and his brother were building houses yeah. and uh, selling them spec basis. Yeah. And then yeah. after that, he was doing more of. Uh, he got into succession planning, which is. Um, dad was able to connect well with farmers and, mm. and people like that. So mm. he was. He kind of found this little niche where he would help farmers um, pass their farm on to the next generation and do mm. all that stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, look, it, I think it can be um, all things, right? Um, and I think uh, I think organization can be hard for people because it's, it's all about discipline, right, um, and finding those habits that reinforce that organization continues to, to be consistent, right? Because you can be organized on Monday and it's a shit fight on Friday, right? That can happen. <laughs> and, you know, most, if you talk to uh, a builder who's trying to build maybe 20 or 30 or 100 homes a year, they'll all tell you the same thing. It's mm. much harder to find people to manage the people that do the work mm. than it is to find people to do the work. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you've been here for a while. Your your um, uh, one of your clients identified an opportunity um, that opened a doorway for you to see things differently. So you went out and started employing people, right? And yeah. started growing your business. Yeah. Um, and then people saw it. They started saying, "Hey, let's go see James. He can probably help us out with this." Yeah. So so what sort of happened after that? And 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 sort of how old are you now when you're when you're in the midst of building that business? Yeah, so I, I'm i getting up to probably around 28, something like that, and I'm oh, having okay. my first children. Wow, so it happened pretty quickly. Um, yeah, <clears throat> 28, getting closer to 30. Mm. The, the next thing that happened in, in that whole uh, chain of events was I started, so I, I think I left off, I was at Bondi Junction fitting out a shop mm. there, the La Senza Lingerie brand. Mm. I don't know if it's still there or not. It was mm. a beautiful shop. We had to work around the clock. One thing mm. I took away from that experience mm. is that if you work on residential construction, you get to work at the daytime and sleep at night. And commercial, you don't. Commercial, yeah, it's right. almost the opposite. So it, it has to be oh, better. That's because they're night. trading during the day, right? Yeah, they're trading during the day. You end up doing a lot of work yeah, in the yeah. middle of the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyways, uh, the con, the kind of the principal, the guys that were organizing it there, the called me and said, look, we got a job for you in, in a little town in Queensland. Mm. And I said, look, I'm not really interested in going back to a little town. I, I'd actually just bought a house in Brisbane and I had tenants in it. And yeah. I don't think that's the right move for me. And it's kind of funny how things go. Like I just hit a point where I, I'd finished their fit out and I, I hadn't been doing enough sales work for my carpenters. Mm. And I had five carpenters. I couldn't find work for them. Mm. So I hit this natural point where I was I was rebuilding my pipeline of, 
of work for these carpenters. And they called me again the second time, and they said, look, do you want to go to Queensland and do this project for us? Yeah. And I said, oh, look, little towns, it's, it's kind of hard there. You know, people have their family groups, and when you're a new guy moving in from Canada, it's, it's a little bit harder to penetrate. Not sure that I want to do that. They called me a third time, and I said, look, I'm just going to look this place up on the Internet and see what I can find out. Mm. So I saw that there's a lake there. You can do water skiing. There's some mountain climbing mm. that you can do. And uh, so I said, right, um, there's a job there. I'm going to go up, and I'm going to do this project. So we ended up building a uh, clinic with uh, – it was basically an old Queenslander, which we raised up on high columns. Uh, and the local doctor uh, did a contract with us to build in the bottom of it. Mm. So it was a doctor's surgery on the bottom, and um, it's still there functioning. I've been over there for routine appointments. Mm. Um, and the top of it was a residence. So it was designed for doctors t- um, doing their uh, training to go and... and mm live upstairs and come downstairs and get some doctor apprenticeship time. And I'm a building guy, so I don't even mm. know the word for apprentice doctor. Mm. So what happened when I started doing this little project, Lawrence, is that I started getting people from the town coming to me and saying, Look, your your work is really good. We like how you've carefully matched up the cladding on this this old Queenslander that we're converting into a clinic, and uh, the work's really good. It's really busy. Would you like to quote a new home? So I actually uh, that's when I learned about systems and how important they are. Mm. I actually took a couple people up on on trying to win the contract to build their new home in the area, and uh, I just doggedly got a notebook and started pricing all the different parts of this this home that I had been asked to quote Mm -hmm. and I I had zero systems so I don't know if you ever quoted a home with zero systems you end up staying up till two o'clock in the morning Mm. um, measuring and calculating and just doing a lot on the fly right manual estimating (coughs) and I called the rep from the hardware store and I said look um, here's a can you do a bill of quantities? Of course, the hardware store never gets back to you in time. and mm. So I, I started going, well, there's a lot of demand. This is getting up to around 2005. The mm. building industry is going crazy. Everybody needs a house built. Mm. Um, but I'm not going to win them because my coding is too inaccurate. I don't have any systems. Surely there has to be a way to cooperate with other people. And I was coming back to that idea. If you want to be successful, you got to find someone else to be successful with mm. or help them become successful. As I was making all these moves to get where I've got, I was utterly terrified. And, you know, the, the next stage, I actually ended up that I was quite good at, <laughs> at making babies. Mm. And me and my wife oh. had three kids that's really a, quickly. That's a skill know. set. Yeah. Something to be proud of. Right? <laughs> Something to be proud of. Put that on the resume. Yeah. <laughs> so Good I, at making babies. Yeah, it's my top skill. Yeah, yeah. mine would yeah. say it used to be now. but Yeah. Um, so I ended up with three children. Uh, one was four years old. One was two years old. One was a newborn. Yeah. Uh, that's a busy household, man. Like, you know. Yeah, that's super busy. It's super yeah. busy. And yeah. I read an article in the newspaper one day. It was talked about having businesses and babies at the same time, and it said that babies are a financial black hole. Yeah. And it, it kind of sparked this little bit of rebellion in me where I was I wanted to prove them wrong. Mm. My wife and I had, had traveled around backpack before we met and got married, and then we found ourselves like, it's really hard to go anywhere with babies. <laughs> We've, we found that really hard yeah, to yeah, travel. It's very difficult. We realized I normally just leave them at home. Our, our feeling <clears> was that fun was sort of postponed for like 20 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't end up being that bad. It wasn't 20 years. It was about five. Well, some, some people say the fun is having and raising the children, right? I don't know if that's true, but that's what they say. 
It's a different thing. Yeah. So we decided we were just going to put our head down and bum up and work really hard whilst the children were really small. So your wife's in the business and she's she's working with you. She is now, yeah. 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 So she we, wasn't then though. She was ra- raising children, of course. Yeah. So there there's a whole story there about you know the best way to work together, mm. raise a family and actually get somewhere mm. financially as well. Mm. So we yeah, got it's, it's pretty difficult, right? I think there's a very tricky. There's yeah. a lesson for a lot of business owners like how do you how do you manage a marriage, manage a family and manage a company or a business, right? It's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, did this clinic and then we started doing little projects around town. A lot of the projects were Queenslanders that needed to be done up. One of the things that a lot of young builders will work on in this area, Lawrence, would be uh, houses get removed, like moved out to um, maybe uh, an old house will get picked up by Mackay Brothers or something like that yep. and moved out to another area. Yep. And then the builders have to stitch them back together. They, mm. they literally cut the houses in half to yeah, move yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a bit of that. Yeah. But one thing I found, Lawrence, was that Again, I just did, I found that I was different from a lot of carpent a lot of carpenters in that I was always worried about my hearing. I'd wear earplugs and I got made fun of for that. Yeah. And I never wanted to breathe too much rat droppings and asbestos and lead paint. And I was always mm. trying to really get that out of it. Mm. And I played around with vacuum cleaners a lot to try and capture these things while I was building. Mm. But I just found it was quite hard because a lot of carpenters just weren't on the same page as me. They just weren't interested in investing well, the it, time. Be, it's because that's rare, right? Like I, I, you know, I worked a bit in construction and no one was thinking like that. You know, it was just you know, turn up, get the job done, go home, right? There was no uh, greater depth in thinking for boys on site. Not not back in those days. It's different now, though, of course. But it's getting better, isn't it? And it, it needs is, yeah. to. So. Anyways, I, I just thought, well, is this the rest of my life? You know, I've got these kids, uh, and I found that working in the heat and getting dirty up high, I just found that I was getting home at, at night, and I was very tired, and, and I got these beautiful little kids. They're mm. so hilarious, mm. but I was too tired to actually enjoy playing with them. Mm. And I was really worried about the ongoing effects of breathing, all these different types of dust that you encounter. And I thought, I wonder what the new home thing would be like. Mm. And uh, so I started looking around, making phone calls. I remember talking to uh, New Steel Homes. They had steel homes. That was their kind of their unique selling proposition. They had a licensing agreement. Mm. Then I talked to GJ Gardner. They had a franchise opportunity. And I talked to Hatondo. They had a franchising opportunity. And I talked to um, Garth Chapman Queenslanders. They had a... I've never heard of those, those guys. I haven't seen too many of their homes, yeah. but they built a beautiful Queensland-style home. Whoever yeah. um, was designing them was, was very good, very accurate yeah. um, details as well. Yeah. So uh, the licensing agreement, I didn't like that. It wasn't quite right. Uh, I found a lot of these opportunities uh, as a young builder – getting a deal passed down from a bigger company, you didn't have control over the profitability on the job. Mm. So they would hand you a contract and go, you can probably build it for that money. Mm. And I just didn't trust that they would do the estimating correct. So I never went ahead with anything like that. Mm. Um, And there's still a few of those operating. And I I would encourage any young builder to stay away from that. Where Mm. if, if someone's handing you a contract that you can take or leave and you haven't done the estimating, on it mm. I mean theoretically g- you can check it over but I don't know if that's really possible it's kind of a trap I, so why I, would they do that? Is, that is that because they had preferred supplier agreements with suppliers and secured pricing at a certain rate was it, is that I can't tell you but uh, the basically they had a central estimating thing who would do a bill of quantities calculate what they thought would be required to build the home mm-hmm. and then they would put it together in a package with the plans and then offer it out as a pre-priced job to various builders mm. the problem is is if they got it wrong with it when they worked out the pricing, yeah, 100%. you're the one that's yeah 
you end up with a baby type yeah, yeah. of thing. Yeah. So yeah. I, I and you I re- already have three of them, so you don't want any more. Right? So. <laughs> yeah. So I, I rejected it on that basis. Those those particular opportunities. Yeah. Um, I looked at Hatondo and GJ's, and really back in the day, I just thought um, GJ's website was slightly better. And one thing also at that point is I is I felt like I chose the one that set the bar the highest. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to hire a personal trainer. Lawrence to to help you get fit you really want to go with the guy that is going to be the toughest with you and not take your excuses Mm. and make you the best you can be Mm. and I felt that they were the ones that would do that for me at that point yeah so I got in there and the first thing I found when I when I went to my first franchise conference with GJ Gardner was that I was a little bit different than the rest of the builders they tended to be you know, 15, 20 years older than me. And they tended to be a lot more financial Mm. that like they had basically got themselves set up in life. I was barely scraping enough money together to start the business. Mm. So you, you had purchased a franchise at this time. Is that what you're saying? Were you in? Yes. Yes. I I chose GJ. I went ahead and bought it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I remember the day I bought it. I, I had coffee with the representative that I was speaking to and I um, went home and told my wife we needed to write a check for 10000 as a deposit. Yeah. And I got in a lot of trouble because I didn't sufficiently consult with her first. I was just about to so ask you that. I said, there's did, another. Did she know that was coming? Yeah. Uh, um, so I've found over the years that um, I've made a lot of errors not consulting with my wife enough when I make yeah. decision things. And I think I've yeah. got better on that because I've learned the hard way. Look, I, I, I think that's entrepreneurs in general. I'm guilty of that too, right? Like, because you just want to run and move forward and make decisions as fast as possible. Yeah. So, um, and then sometimes you say, well, I'm going to do all the work anyway, so I'll just make the decision, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I guess it is a partnership to a point, right? Because um, she's looking after three kids. But so there's a lesson for the kids out there. I yeah. consult with your partner. <laughs> that a hundred percent. That's what. That's the moral of the story. Um, yeah. And when we're now in this current day and age, I talk to a lot of young builders uh, who are considering Stroud, and I say, now, we ideally we have w- when we present the business opportunity, we have the partner, the wife there as well, mm. and uh, mm. answer all of their questions. Yeah. So I went ahead. Um, so in the early days, I was still finishing off some renovations. I had two sets of clothes in the in the ute. I would put on my King G's, go help the boys lift up a beam, give them some yeah. directions for the rest of the day, Yeah. and then drive to the office, and my secretary would be calling me saying, look, there's someone coming in at 10. They want to talk to you about building and getting a quote prepared. Yeah. So I would get the dust off me and yeah. put on my uh, – my uniform and some some clean pants and and some leather shoes and take off the dirty old boots and yeah and go in and yeah that was a real motivation for me to try to become good at selling homes and getting my business going was that I didn't have to carry two sets of clothes in my youth every morning yeah and I could stop doing the renovations and just build new homes yeah 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 so here I am I, I'm a a fresh import from Canada. I've been around for about, uh, in Australia, for about, what would that have been? 10, 12 years, uh, do you think? 10 years? Well, it was about five years since I, seven years since I moved over, I'd say. Somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah. And uh, So all of this has really happened in quite a short time frame. Because that's not a long time, really. Not an no. awful lot of time. I got my, you know, I had to work hard to get my builder's license sorted out. It was yeah. all night school. So yeah. I was running five carpenters and then I'd be leaving yeah. the jobs and driving yeah. straight to TAFE. A lot of nights I didn't go home first. Yeah, yeah, I went yeah. straight from work to TAFE. And you're getting <clears> home at eight thirty, nine o'clock at night. The babies are all asleep. Mm. And you just go to bed, roll up at 5.30 the next morning and go do it again. Mm. So they were tough years. Yeah. So anyways, I got this new franchise, and I, and I went in, and I'm sitting around this table in the Sofitel in Brisbane, and all of these um, old gardener builders around there, and uh, they're all the Queensland GJ gardener builders. And what I found, Lawrence, was everything I said, they thought it was funny. 
because I had this Canadian accent. Mm. You've still got that, by the way. Do I? <laughs> people, yeah, yeah, people say that. So, yeah. and my ideas <clears throat> were different because, like, you can't not be 20 years younger from a different country and have the same and not mm. have different ideas. Yeah, it's logical, right? Yeah. And so, over the next five years, I slowly worked it out, worked out the game and worked out what you had to do and you had to really focus on the customer. And in my uh, fifth year with G.J. Gardner, I won um, Franchisee of the Year. Mm. And, I, and I won that based on one metric, one main metric, and it was um, best market share. So back in that day, we had really excellent reporting from Cordell. Mm. Uh, I believe it was Cordell. And then, since then, they've brought in privacy laws, so you can't get as good of information about how mm. much market share you're winning. Mm. But back then, we had a full list of every home that was approved by the council, yeah. which builder was building it, what yeah. the contract sum well, was. Wow, really? That's good We know exactly what our market share was. Yeah. And so in that fifth year, I topped out at 25.4% of the market share. Yeah. The second place um, franchisee at G.J. Gardner was Toowoomba at 7.4%. And the third place was one was around uh, 4%, I think. And the lowest was 1.5%. Mm. So that gives you a scale of the market shares that were being So that achieved. was more than uh, more than double what the, what the second place was. A- as the young guy, right? As yes. As the new guy. So this is where the trouble started. Mm. I bet. So the <clears throat> before I tell you about the trouble that started, um, I'll tell you about the uh, how, how did I get there, you know? I, you can tell from listening to me talk, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, I found, but what I always have done is I've been able to have the humility to listen to people that are smarter than me and take their yeah. advice and somehow turn that into action. Yeah. So I found some really good mentors because in the first two years of my franchise, I the the main thing I learned is how unequipped I was to run a business. Mm. Can you expand on that a little bit? What do you mean as in terms of commercial oh, knowledge or sales? I can expand on it, Lawrence. Like the, yeah. It was so hard. I just found that I was used to apprentices on a building site, and apprentices are mostly other young, young fellas. Mm-hmm. And you can deal with them in a certain way. They respond to a little bit of ribbing. Yeah. And, you know, there's a certain rough and tumble way yep. that things happen on a building site. Uh, everybody yep. understands how it is. You go and hire some some ladies to be your contract administrator and a mm. salesperson mm. who's a, a personality-driven fella, mm. not that accurate, office staff. And then you behave like you do on a building site in an office. You get yourself into all sort of pr- troubles. Mm. And that's what so you had to re- relearn communication, right? That's, yes, that's, one that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and I, I found that I was a, a fish out of water, and the effect was really high turnover of staff. Yeah. So I, w- I got to the point where I was like, well, people like my houses. I can sell houses good, but this whole staffing thing is driving me crazy. They're mm. quitting. They're unhappy with me. Mm. I, I just didn't understand management at all. Yeah. So I I did a management course with a with a guy from Melbourne who I still use to this day to train the builders at Stroud Homes. Mm. Russ Wiley is his name. He's a brilliant guy. Mm. And then I I a little bit later Can on. Can I ask just just on that? So what makes him a brilliant guy to train? He just won't give builders. up until you get the idea. You yeah. Know? So he's resilient. He he, he actually uh, really wants you to learn what it takes to be a manager. Yeah. And he just, so he had a uh, an online conference call. It was pre-Zoom times. We just jump on the phone once a week with some mm. other business owners that we're trying to mm. learn about how to run mm. a business. Mm. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that, right? I think it's, you know, if you're employing someone to be a leader and run a business to be successful, that benefits him and his family and your company so that company can grow right, and have some level of contribution. Yeah. The data that's put in front of them when you train them is so critical to get that right. Because, uh, so, and, and here's the thing, everyone's different, right? 
Yeah. Not everyone is going to hear it the same way. Not everybody is going to understand it as easy as the guy standing next to him. So there's all these varying different things with leadership. Uh, because I think people don't want to be managed, they want to be led, right? Management can be hard for some people who are business owners. Look, I hope you found something that you liked or that you think may work for your business. Uh, if you haven't already, click the subscribe button. We try to push out as, as much content and good content as we can. Really appreciate your watching and uh, look forward to speaking to you next time.